Dr. Richard Alley is the Evan Pugh University Professor of Geosciences at Penn State University, where he focuses on glaciology, ice sheet stability, and understanding how Earth's climate has changed by examining its ice cores. Dr. Alley, welcome to the Climate Pod. Well, thank you, Ty. It's a pleasure. Well, you've been studying ice for decades. How does studying ice help us better understand how humans have warmed the planet over the last 150 years? Yeah. So there's a number of things. Um, one is climate history. Ice cores are these fantastic archives of what happened. And we can count, I have helped count 100,000 years in an ice core. We can see what was blowing through the air, dust, sea salt, pollen, micrometeorites, uh, things produced by cosmic rays. We have little bubbles that have samples of the air itself. We have records of how much it snowed, of what the temperature was. And so we can help put together these histories of climate. And what we find, climate has always changed. Climate changes have always affected living things. So they're important. Climate has changed for a whole lot of reasons, but especially because of changes in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We're driving a really huge, fast change in carbon dioxide, and the history of climate gives us very high confidence that this will impact living things, it will impact physical systems, it matters. Well, how have you seen the, you know, this field of ice core studying and, and glacier and ice shelf research change over your career? It's fantastic how much more we know, how much better we can see. Um, the, the geophysical instrumentation, the satellites, the models, the, the mass spectrometers, and people are just doing fantastic fantastic, wonderful things in learning what's going on. A lot of it is a little disquieting um, because we're learning that, yes, the climate changes a lot and it affects things a lot and sea level changes a lot. But the ability to see this, the ability to pound on the table and say the data are right, the understanding is strong, this works, is just changed immensely in my lifetime from a huge number of people putting their lives into it. Well, what first sparked your interest in the field in the first place? So I, we visited Yellowstone. I collected rocks. I decided to be a geologist. Uh, I went to Ohio State because it was down the road and, and I could afford that. Um, and I needed a summer job. And there were two summer jobs. One was cleaning fossils with a dental pick. And the other one was working with the glaciologist. And so I decided to work with the glaciologist in the summer of 1977, and I'm still doing it. And the rest is history. Well, you're part of the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration, and that's really what you know, we're here to talk about today. So what is a Thwaites Glacier, and why is it important enough to have an international team of scientists studying it? Yeah, so... so if, if you let me do the professor thing, <laughs> our daughters used to say he has a professor button and they'd say, oh no, you pushed his professor button. He's about to profess. <laughs> and then I would profess. So, so an ice sheet, if, if you have ever made pancakes for breakfast, you pour the pancake batter on the griddle and you make a little pile and then the pile spreads under its own weight. Right? That's what an ice sheet is. You snow on the land faster than it melts and it makes a pile and then the pile spreads under its own weight. And eventually you get a balance. If you think about Antarctica as this humongous pancake sitting on something underneath that would look like Australia if we got in some coastal basins, if we got rid of the ice, the pile built up and then snow keeps piling on top, but it does not pile up and up and up and up and up until the world rolls over. It spreads, it flows out to the coast and it either melts at the edges in Greenland or it breaks off as icebergs in Antarctica. And then those float away and look for something to try to sink. And, you know, all so, so so that's a big picture of, a, of an ice sheet. And what, 
a little complexity. In Antarctica, it is generally cold enough that when the spreading pile gets to floating in the ocean, it does not immediately break off. It's spreading along, but it remains attached. Almost always, that will run a ground locally on a high in the seafloor that has ocean around it, or it's in a bay or a fjord and there's friction on the sides. So the friction here or on the sides of those ice shelves holds back the floating piece. And then the floating piece is holding back the non-floating piece so that the ice sheet is bigger and the ocean is smaller than they would be if we didn't have these floating extensions, these ice shelves. Ice shell Antarctica is cold, right? It's minus 50 up on top. You warm it to minus 45, it's not going to melt. But at the edge, it's really close to melting on top of these ice shelves during the summer. And it's at melting below them because they're in the water. And so little changes can affect these ice shelves. If the ice shelves weaken or break off, then you lose this friction that lets the pile spread faster. And that takes ice out of storage in Antarctica, puts it in the ocean and floods your coast. We worry the ice shelves tend to exist in the coldest water that's common in the world ocean. They tend to live in this stuff that was made when sea ice formed. And it's the coldest water in the ocean, which means the best you can do if you change anything is nothing. Everything else is bad. There's no way to bring in colder water because there isn't anything. So basically all change is bad for ice shelves. It's neutral or bad. We're changing lots of things. Warmer water is getting under them. Warmer air is getting over them. A lot of these changes are weakening them, maybe breaking them off. When we look around Antarctica, there's lots to be worried about, but Thwaites Glacier is the first place that is likely to both lose its ice shelf and have a big change because it lost its ice shelf. Um, two of the grand people of our field, George Denton and Terry Hughes had looked at this decades ago and they said, that's the weak underbelly of the ice sheet. And so we are trying as fast and as well as we can to get a handle on this massive outflow and its floating extension. And we is the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration, which is British, US, um, some folks from Germany and Sweden and Korea, um, dozens and dozens of just brilliant, dedicated scientists, a whole lot of young people who are making careers out of this. It's truly a, a wonderful undertaking done with the fear that we're not doing it fast enough. Well, in December at the American Geophysical Union, the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration presented their latest findings to the public. So what were the main takeaways from that report? Yes, so, so the main takeaways, things are happening. We are losing, likely to lose fairly soon, a chunk of the ice shelf. Whether it quite all goes away or not remains to be seen. Um, there was a presentation, Aaron Pettit gave one. I have to, I'm gonna brag a little bit. Um, the, a key paper on this came out shortly before the meeting. It was published in the cryosphere. And that one, the lead author is, is our daughter, Karen Alley, um, who is a, a young professor at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. And so, um, so there's a, a lot of people involved in this work, but the warming waters are causing damage to the, the ice shelf and it's, it, it could go pretty rapidly. Um, exactly predicting when something breaks is really hard. And I'll, I'll, I have a coffee mug here. It's a ceramic coffee mug. Um, if you think a little bit about every ceramic mug or every ceramic coffee cup you've ever seen dropped on a hard floor. Okay. 
Some of them bounce, some of them chip, some of them the handle breaks off, some of them smash into smithereens and it takes you forever to clean up the little shards. Um, I have a background that includes some coursework in metallurgical engineering. And I took the broken things course. And the professor said, you know, you can build beautiful probability density functions of the average behavior of a whole lot of things dropped on a hard floor. We can quantify that beautifully. But the professor said, don't you dare get yourself into a situation where you have to predict the next break because that's really hard. If you drop that coffee cup, do you know whether it's gonna chip, bounce or break into smithereens? That one. And we're trying to predict that one ice shelf and when it will break. So you've seen, you know, maybe five years, maybe 10 years. It's a hard thing to get to. If we had a whole bunch of ice shelves and we were predicting the average behavior of a lot of them, they'd nail it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but this one is clearly in trouble that is pointing in bad directions. Now, simply loss of this one will not dump the entire ice sheet into the ocean immediately. It's a step on uh, in a direction that eventually could lead to a lot of sea level rise. And it's not a it's not a good thing. It's not something that we would cheer if we like to keep our current coastline. Is the Thwaites glacier unique in that regard? It's the first one that's likely to do this. So we actually have colleagues who are spending a lot of time looking at Totten over in East Antarctica. Uh, the total ability, so the ice sheets can sort of kind of raise sea level 200 feet. Wow. Right. That's a lot of ice. Most of it can't go really fast. So um, if you probably know if you put ice cubes in a glass and leave them in the glass just with air, just pile them in, they will melt. But if you pour the iced tea on them, they're going to melt faster. It's easier to melt stuff in the ocean than it is to melt it in the air. And it's really easy if you break it off and let it go float away and find some warm water to melt in. And so the places where the ice sheet is able to dump ice into the ocean are the ones we especially worry about for fast sea level rise. Greenland can dump some icebergs, but then it will pull back up onto land and then it has to wait for warm air to melt it. And probably that gives us centuries to get rid of all the ice in Greenland. Antarctica, a lot of the ice would pull back up into East Antarctica on this land that would look like Australia if the, the ice went away. And so most of the ice it has to melt slowly, centuries or longer, but some of it can dump really fast fast, and that could be centuries or decades. And so when we look at the places that can dump really fast, Thwaites is number one, but there are some other places in West Antarctica and around into East Antarctica that even together have more ice than Thwaites. We just think that they'll be a little slower. Yeah, in 2020, we talked to Dr. Michaela King about the increasing rate of ice sheet loss in Greenland. So are you saying that the the Antarctic is at a greater threat of increasing sea levels than the Arctic? Yeah, this is a wonder. So Michaela's great, and, and I'm glad you, you had that chat. It, it's fascinating. Um, Greenland, we're pretty sure. You warm it up. Greenland is already losing a lot of mass. It is melting on top. If you make the air warm, it's going to melt on top. That puts water into the ocean, and that will raise sea level. That one sort of pound on the table, near certainty, yes, warming is going to do it. Antarctica takes a lot of warming before it would be losing mass on top the way Greenland is, because it's so cold on top. And so Antarctica gets into this, will it break, won't it break, will it flow really fast? And so the, the potential to raise sea level is greater in Antarctica. The uncertainty about whether it will do it 
is worse in Antarctica. It's, uh, if you look at the latest UN projections, they have almost sort of three feet of rise by 2100 for the ocean under the strongest warming that they consider. And that's sort of a foot from mountain glaciers, the things up in the Alps and the Rockies melting and dumping water in the ocean, sort of a foot because the ocean is getting warmer and it expands, and sort of a foot from a tiny bit in Antarctica and mostly melting in Greenland. And then they have this little dashed line that's another three feet or something like that, which is mostly maybe things will break and do bad things. And so the sort of Antarctica, which could even be worse than that, um, is, you know, you look at the 2100 and yes, we're raising sea level. There's some of it we're just sure of. And then the uncertainties are all most entirely on the bad side. It's really hard to find a future that's better than what the UN is showing. It's not that hard to find a future that's worse. I know you've worked with the IPCC before in the past. How have the projections of the IPCC kind of played out as far as um, their predictions for sea level rise? Yeah, so there, there's a few scientific papers have looked back how the, the IPCC has had a variety of reports. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, uh, I think, 1990, 1995, 2001, 2007, and so on and so forth. And the sea level rise projections, well, if you go back and ask how have the temperature projections done, they've been brilliant. They're just almost spot on. So what, what the idea, you know this, what the IPCC does is say, we do not know what decisions governments will take. So we don't know how much CO2 will rise, how much methane will rise, how many particles we'll put up from smokestacks to block the sun. So we'll take a range of scenarios. And then for each scenario, we'll try to, to tell you what that would mean. And so we call them projections, not predictions, because then the governments choose where, which one we follow ultimately. And for those, you can then go back and ask how much CO2 did we release? And using that one, how well did the projections do? And for the temperature, it's been just about spot on. Um, the IPCC always projects sort of smooth things. They, they run the model a bunch of times in average over the wiggles and the real world follows one set of wiggles. So if you look, the projections are always smooth and the real world wandered around it, but the temperatures are about on. And the sea level has tended right near the upper end of their uncertainty bound. They've always been the most likely sea level projections have always looked a little um, low compared to what then happened. But the differences are not immense compared to what we're talking about. The question is, as you run this into the future and you have the, the real sea level rise running higher, will those run parallel or will they diverge as you go into the future. And we're, we're nervous about that. And like I say, right now, if you look at the most recent report, which has just come out, they've got this beautiful quantified band, and then there's this dashed line sitting well above it. So what would happen if the Thwaites ice shelf were to collapse? So right now, this again, we, we get to uh, nerding out and, and Professor Button. So um, Thwaites has this fantastic ability to dump icebergs. So back, I studied at Wisconsin. I studied under a fellow named Charlie Bentley, the late great Charlie Bentley. Charlie Bentley went to Antarctica in the International Geophysical Year in 1957. He defended his thesis one day. He got on the train the next day. He went to Panama. He caught the ship to Antarctica. He spent two and a half years in Antarctica. 
he wintered over twice. He came home and he had not graduated because they had not paid the $50 thesis fee so he could graduate. And he discovered out in the middle of West Antarctica that it was not Australia with snow on top. It was actually a deep marine basin next to Australia with snow on top. And so there's a whole lot of ice in West Antarctica up from Thwaites that is too thick to float. But there's also a really deep thing that should be a seafloor, and it's the, the Bentley Trench and the Bird Subglacial Basin. And if right now Thwaites is got an ice shelf that's sort of 500 meters thick, 1,500 feet ish. And it's sitting on a bumpy, rocky dead rock sill. And if it loses its ice shelf, it will thin a little and float a little. And where it starts to float, will move towards the Bentley Trench. But it won't be in it yet. And so it'll speed up a little and it'll, it'll flow a little faster and we're working really hard to know how much. But if it keeps thinning and floating and retreating, at some point that 1500 foot high cliff could possibly go into the trench. And then you start thinking about a mile high cliff or more, right? Something that, that's El Capitan's plus. Um, and ice is not as strong as the granite of Yosemite. And then we get really worried that if it gets that far, that it then will start falling apart really rapidly. And that will take both the, the stuff that doesn't raise sea level because it's already below sea level and the stuff that does raise sea level and dump it all into the ocean. So the, the worry is this is a step in the direction that if it keeps going, eventually could lead to very large rapid sea level rise. With that particular drainage, if it all goes, is a bit over three meters, you know, 10 or 11 feet of sea level if it connects to all the through all the deep basins to the rest of the ice in West Antarctica. I mean, what does that kind of sea level rise do to low-lying nations and uh, coastal communities? Yeah, I, I, it, I can recall we were up in Boston and we had gone out the old iron sides and we're taking the water taxi back. And I was just sitting there sort of putting that much water over my head and then looking at the harbor. And it's, I, I don't quite know what to do with that. And I don't know what you do if you're living on a Delta in Bangladesh or something like that. It's, it's a lot of water. Well, Rolling Stone Magazine's Jeff Goodell dubbed the Thwaites Glacier the Doomsday Glacier. So why do you think he calls it the Doomsday Glacier? Yeah, it's, it's sort of the, this idea that if, if the worst happens, it's probably the place that physically is most capable of causing a lot of harm to humanity in a big hurry. Uh, this, this whole idea of tipping points in the climate system, you know, if you push and things change smoothly and yeah, maybe it goes a little faster, a little slower than you expected, but you see it coming, you use your adaptability, you use whatever you've got to try to prepare for what's coming. And then something surprises you and you could call it an abrupt change. You could call it a tipping point. You could call it a black swan. People have these different names in the physical world, this one's really high and maybe the place that would be most likely to be a nasty tipping point. Um, the physical world tends to, it has diffusion, it tends to smooth things out. So usually it sort of kind of behaves itself. Uh, biology, you know, at some point it can get dry enough and you have a massive fire and your rainforest comes back as a savanna and it went away like that. Human systems, you know, at some point when we're stressed, we either get together and solve the problem or we get out our guns and shoot each other. Um, we build walls to protect our cities and then the water goes over the wall and just a little bit can cause 
you know, so much for that city for a while. Um, so, so when you think about tipping points, Thwaites is really high on the list and maybe number one of the physical tipping points that could, could really get to us. I don't know if you've seen this yet or not, but in Adam McKay's new movie, Don't Look Up, there's this comet that's hurtling toward Earth while science try to, scientists try to convince politicians to do something about it, while the media and basically half the population doesn't seem to care too much about it. Now, clearly, this movie or this comet is an analogy for climate change, but we know that most impacts of climate change happen slowly over time, and they affect different regions and different communities differently. But could the breaking of the Thwaites ice shelf be this kind of singular tipping point event that's really the best analogy to the comet in Don't Look Up? Yeah, I desperately hope not, but I don't know. Um, it's, I still hope that we learn enough to provide guidance and then people make wise decisions. Uh, at this point, I mean, you know, you have spoken to people on this podcast that at this point, the, the economics is in the same direction as the ethics that, that, you know, the Nobel Prize in economics says that we are hurting ourselves economically, hurting ourselves employment wise by not dealing with this. And so if we can get moving fast on solving the problems, we really might miss the worst of this. There's a paper came out last year, Rob DeCanto is the first author, I'm one of a cloud of co-authors that helped with this, that indicates that our, the most likely answer for, for Thwaites is that if we hold warming to a level that, that is economically beneficial to us, we also might miss the tipping point in Thwaites. So yeah, so I think that's kind of my my next question because we did talk to Dr. Ed Hawkins last uh, I guess fall uh, about the 2021 IPCC report, which basically said you know we've got warming locked in for the next three decades, no matter what, potentially more if we don't eliminate those carbon emissions. So are we too late? Is this collapse of the ice shelf and the resulting ice stream in the ocean inevitable, or is there still time to act? Yeah, probably still time to act. And I hate to do the, but we're not sure, but we're not sure. So you can find papers from very, very good people who say we've already committed first slowly and then more rapidly to the loss. You can also find a lot of papers from very good people that say we still have a safety margin. Um, there's a brilliant paper from my colleague Byron Parasak, who works here at Penn State, and I'm, I'm a co-author on this, but, but this is Byron's work. And he showed what some, a lot of what we need to know to answer that question. And in particular, sort of, there, there's some knobs that you can dial in the model for how the slipperiness of the bed changes as the ice shelf falls off. And when he wrote this a few years ago, you could sort of set the knob any where you wanted. And as you turned the knob, it went from we're doomed to we have a safety cushion. And then, <laughs> so I, another brilliant colleague, colleague here, Sridhar Krishnan, has been doing some of the geophysics. He's one of the leaders in one of the groups of the International Thwaites Glacier Consortium at, at, at collaboration. And so um, he has done a lot of the study of the bed of the ice sheet that feeds into Byron's modeling. It's just fascinating. And the amount of not the, the beauty of the data and the, the understanding that comes out of this, but we haven't fully answered that one yet. And that's one reason that there are more people headed for the field and where we lost a couple of years to COVID that, that we should have really key data to help answer that question that have been missing for the last two years. And the hope is that come November, there will be teams headed down to, to start filling that in. So right now, I think most people would lean towards a very slim safety margin. 
but I can't pound on the table and tell you that one for sure. Given that there is such a slim safety margin, I just wonder, is there anything that can be done? I, I spoke with the science fiction writer, Kim Stanley Robinson last year about his book, Ministry of the Future, which is, is fiction, of course. But one of the storylines is about a team of glaciologists that are trying to slow down basically the sliding of a glacier, you know, or, or the ice shelf into the ocean. Now, is this purely science fiction or are scientists looking at ways of basically geoengineering iceberg or geoengineering glaciers as a way of slowing the potential impact on drastically raising sea levels? Right. So people are looking at ways to do this. I think so far the general conclusion is it would not work very well. Um, it's and it's been for a while. So our, our colleague Doug McHale up at University of Chicago looked at this a, a long time ago. Uh, more recently, there are one study said that if if everything was favorable. So the most optimistic look that the large, sort of the largest civil engineering project in human history might possibly save Thwaites if everything is on the favorable end, but if it's non-favorable, yeah. So I'm not, and, and because this is an ocean system, um, so much of the forcing comes from the ocean change. And because of this issue that, change is bad because it wants those coldest waters that it's been living in. It isn't enough to just cool the atmosphere because if cooling the atmosphere changes the winds, you might do something to the ocean that isn't good. So we'd actually have to have a really strong understanding of how the ocean atmosphere system works down there and make sure there's, there's some studies that have said, look, when the ice sheet starts dumping uh, icebergs out like crazy, that's going to make it colder on the surface and then that'll save it. But it turns out that probably changes ocean circulation in a way that warms it down where it does the most damage. So it's a coupled system and you will, you could probably find some fascinating people to talk to who would tell you what we don't know about the Southern Ocean. But the Southern Ocean is a lot more than krill and penguins, which is fantastic in themselves, and getting seasick when you go across. The Southern Ocean is this immense, powerful, you know, flywheel of the climate system, and the uncertainties are being addressed really fast, but they're huge. We talked about at the top of this conversation that you've been studying ice cores for a long time. You know, has there ever been, you know, in, in the, 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 what you've studied, have you ever seen the rate of warming uh, ob observed that we're, we're seeing now? Have you seen that observed in, in the past? Yeah. So, so we, I, I probably got tenure because there were horrible things in an ice core at Greenland, but <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so there are certainly records of jumps in the climate system in the past that were linked to changes in ocean circulation, um, but they're they're regional things. So, so more very crudely, the climate of the Earth is the the average temperature of the globe is mainly CO two, and then. The distribution is things like ocean circulation and what have you. So, so there were these jumps in the past that one place it does this, and then it jumps this way, and then riding on the back of the CO2, moving it up and down like that. And it's surely more than that. I'm about to start teaching a class where we spend a semester trying to refine what I just said a little bit, and we don't get done in a semester. So I oversimplified, but CO2, sort of the more CO2, the world's warmer, less CO2, the world's colder. Occasionally while that's changing, it, it affects something else that will shift currents, uh, winds from one place to another. And so you see jumps. Some of those jumps were really fast, but the CO2 changes we're driving are 
except for the meteorite that killed the dinosaur, they, they look really fast compared to what nature has done in the past. And how do we know that increased rate of warming is caused by humans? Yeah, so this one is, is pretty well nailed. Um, the, the basic physics, CO2 makes it warmer. Um, mostly were put together in the 1800s and leading up to Arrhenius in 1896, calculating the warming from fossil fuel burning. Uh, and Arrhenius more or less had it right. This is before people figured out quantum mechanics. The, the putting this into quantum was done, a lot of the work came out of the researchers working for the US Air Force right after World War II. Now, they were not actually doing climate change initially. They were doing things like, what kind of sensor should we put on a heat-seeking missile so we can protect our big cities from enemy bombers? And they, heat-seeking missiles use infrared radiation. And the hot exhaust of the enemy bomber emits infrared. And if you put the wrong sensor on, you can't see the target because CO2 is absorbing the energy. And even today, it's a chilly day in central Pennsylvania, but there is a whole lot more infrared radiation going up from the earth than coming down from enemy bombers. And so um, the CO2 absorbs that. When we were getting satellites, they predicted what the satellite would see when it looks down. It has seen that. The changes in the Earth's radiation budget as we have raised CO2 and methane and done other things were predicted. They are happening. This is just fact. And it's physics in some bizarre sense. If, if someone argues that our CO2 does not drive warming, they're also arguing that the Air Force doesn't understand how to put a sensor on a heat seeking missile because there's so much commonality in the physics. When we take that understanding and apply it to history, it works pretty well for the time we've been watching with modern instruments and it works pretty well far back in history with the asterisk that if our models are doing something wrong, the earth responds a little more than the models do far back in time. You could say the models are right. You could say the earth is a little more changeable, but there's no support for the idea that the earth is less changeable than the models. Well, Dr. Ali, your contributions to the field of glaciology and climate research and communications have been immense. And it's really been an honor speaking with you today. I know you're not on Twitter, but where can our audience learn more about your work? Yeah, so <laughs> we keep trying to put it in the little literature. We got a homepage. You, you can find me at Penn State and, and look it up. It's a little bit older now, but um, I had the opportunity to, to make some um, PBS miniseries um, back a decade or so now, something called Earth, the Operator's Manual. I did it with Jeff Haynes Stiles and Erna Cugano, just award-winning television producer and director, fantastic people. And this is on YouTube. So if you pop into Earth, the operator's manual under my name. Um, it, it's, I think, a hopeful look at what we can do, um, as well as what happens if we don't do. And it was a real effort to get different voices to tell the same story, um, voices that you might, the, the Marines and the Texas ranchers and the, the rear admiral telling us about climate change problems and solutions. Um, I learned a lot, so. Well, I'm not gonna ask you to sing this early on a Monday morning, but there's also a great video of you on YouTube singing about the South Pole. So I would suggest our audience Take a look at that as well. Dr. Ali, thank you so much for joining the Climate Pod. It is my pleasure, Ty. Thank you and take care.